Blessed evening to every one of us. Welcome to Pagasa Center Bible Study Night. And tonight, Brother Ken Camposano will continue in the book of Hebrews chapter 4. And as I've said last time that this chapter has meant a lot in my life that a good old friend eventually surrendered his life when I talk about this chapter 4 of the book of Hebrews and so let us focus let's uh, listen and then eventually you go to the Bible and read it again and let God speak to you and so let's humble ourselves before God Lord we continue to honor you we worship you we adore you and we continue to say to you that we are nothing and we still sin against you and so we ask for your mercy that you forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness that today lord tonight our vessels will be clean and that you will allow us to receive and store your word in our hearts and in our minds that it will help us in this journey of faith God, thank you. We bless your holy name, O oh God, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. And so, let's worship the Lord. Let's join the music team. Hallelujah. a melody that was not taught in the darkest night it still goes on the anthem of my God within my heart is a treasure that cannot be bought when all else is faded presence of my God can magnify the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. No one beside you, Lord. Honor and praise are yours forever. Before your throne is a mystery that can be known. Is a majesty that's yours alone. How glorious you are! You are the
Give God the best cup of praise. You are worthy, Jesus. You are worthy. Thank you. Hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday Bible study night. Um, and first of all, I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Brother Ken Camposano, and I'm one of the primary leaders of Bishop Doc here in Pagasa Center, UK. And first of all, I want to give glory and honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, and also I want to honor and thank my leaders, uh, Bishop Godofredo Ambat and uh, Pastor Sir Shirley Ambat for this privilege, uh, this wonderful privilege that you have given me that I am able to speak tonight and deliver uh, God's message uh, for the people. I also want to acknowledge, of course, our Pastor Gosh, Pastor Benfor, Pastor Doris, Pastor Allen, and all my co-primary leaders and I want to welcome the, the the people who are here for the first time you are our very important person and I believe that it is not an accident that you are here and I believe that God has something for you tonight that your life will never be the same after this and I believe also that God has appointed you here tonight so that you will hear his message and of course I want to Welcome also our Pagasa brethren, uh, wherever you are around the UK or around the world who is tuned in tonight. Hello, good evening, uh, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are today tonight. Um, so uh, our topic for tonight is a continuation of what we have discussed from last week. So we are going to again look at Hebrews 4, uh, which is about the invitation to Christ, uh, to Christ's rest. But tonight we are on our part two. And also after the part two, we're also going to look at um, another topic uh, at the end of uh, Hebrews chapter four, which is about Jesus being our high priest. So our main verses for tonight is Hebrews 4, 11 to 16. And before we go through it, uh, can I just ask everyone to close their eyes and bow their heads? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, O Lord God, for this wonderful opportunity again to come together, O Lord God, to hear your word and to learn from you, O Lord God. And we pray, O Lord God, as these words, O Lord God, as we discuss and as we study your word tonight, Lord, we pray that it will bring transformation, it will bring new information in us, and it will bring knowledge, O Lord God, so that our faith, O Lord God, will be strengthened, our faith will increase, O Lord God. Lord, uh, continue to move uh, in the lives of each people, Lord, who are listening tonight, and that you will just touch their hearts, Lord God. And Lord, uh, I ask, Lord, for a double portion of your anointing tonight, Lord God, as, as I deliver and I speak this word, Lord God. Lord, prepare the hearts of your people. Lord, we want to thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So before we go to the part two of our topic, uh, an invitation to uh, Christ rest. Let's just look at um, just a, a quick recap from the main points from last week. So our first main point from last week was entering God's rest should be a priority for God's children. So the rest that Jesus offers is available and accessible to all believers. But we have to fear unbelief because this will not because this will not allow us to experience the rest that Jesus offers. But the believer benefits when they make entering God's rest a significant priority in their lives. And it is not just enough to almost make the rest or enter his rest. We don't want to come short of it. So it should be the main priority for us. Number two is God's rest is accessed by faith. We can access God's rest through faith. 
not through our own performance or through our own works. Trust in God is key to a life of God's rest. And yes, we might know all God, uh, uh, God's promises, all what He asked for us, but a lack of trust in Him often keeps us from moving out into His purpose for our lives. So let us get rid of that unbelief and let us access the rest of God through faith. Yeah, let's trust in God. Number three is God's rest takes us back to and beyond the original access to God. The rest that God offers to His people today takes us back to our original access to God and beyond it. For we are now able to bring God our shame, our embarrassment, and need for mercy. And we can come to Him for encouragement and help. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Number four, believers ought to enter into God's rest daily. God's rest is available for God's people right now, anytime. And we can get back to the throne, promise and joy of God. So those are the uh, main points from last week. And let's now look at the part two. Um, let's read um, Hebrews 4, 11, 13. So it says here from reading from ESV version, it says, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So we can continue to the next point. But again, it's, it's revisiting the first point again, which is entering God's rest should be a major priority. So let's reread again Hebrews 4.11. It says, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So again, the author declares in his main exhortation that the believers should prioritize entrance in God's rest. It ought to be a major priority in their lives. So say to the person beside you, it ought to be a major priority in your in your life. Okay. In verse 1, it was previously written, Let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. But now here it says in verse um, verse 11, he says, strive to enter that rest. So Israel fell from the promised joy of God because of the disobedience and unbelief. And the same thing can happen to any professing Christian or professing believer Christ. And to keep that from happening and to show that we are more than mere professing Christians or believer of Christ, he says, be diligent to enter God's rest. Can you say that to the person beside you? Be diligent to enter God's rest. So, be diligent by, from Hebrews 2.1, it says, pay close attention to what you've heard. Be diligent in Hebrews 2.3. Don't neglect your great salvation. Be diligent in Hebrews 3.1. Consider Jesus. Be diligent uh, from Hebrews 3.8. Do not harden your hearts. Be diligent, Hebrews 3.12, to take care against an unbelieving heart. Um, be diligent by exhort one another every day against the deceitfulness of sin in Hebrews 3.14. And be diligent by fear the unbelief that will keep you from the promised rest in Hebrews 4.1. So do you get what we, what we are trying to say here? That we must receive this exhortation be to strive and be diligent to enter god's rest because the rest of god is worth it open your heart examine your soul you know quit trusting in your own works in yourself uh, to get to the rest of god but what we want to do is begin to trust in god access the rest of god through faith the Christian life to life of day by day, hour by hour, trust in the promise of God, right? And this is to help us and guide us to take care of us and forgive us. 
This is to bring us into a future of holiness and joy that will satisfy our hearts more than if we forsake Him and put our trust um, in the promises of this world. And that day by day, hour by hour, trust in God's promise is not automatic. It is the result of daily diligence and its result of proper fear. So let us, yes, as, as I've said, let us trust in God's promises. Let us trust in God day by day, hour and hour. And it doesn't just go come automatically in our lives. It is the result of your diligence, daily diligence, and your fear of the Lord. So let's look at uh, the next point. God's rest is offered in God's word. So let's read in Hebrews 4, 12, 13 in ESV. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So following the author's exhortation about God's rest, I hope and pray that you all want the rest that God has offered at this point. And I hope that you want to go into that rest, enter that rest for the rest of your life. And I hope that you want to enter it by faith. So let's just focus again on, on, on what the author is saying here. There is a sudden shift from the rest of God to the word of God and his description of the word of God is beautiful God's word is alive and active it is sharp cutting between soul and spirit it can discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart it leaves us naked and exposed before God for it reveals us and the word of God illuminates the soul God's word diagnoses the condition of man with the surgeon's precision it lays open the heart and accurately discerns spiritual health. In the case of those, the writer of the Hebrews first address, uh, the people uh, were ready to follow in the failure of the children of Israel, or basically follow in their footsteps to give up strong living faith. So let us look at the word of God is living and active. When the word of God exposes our weakness, and unbelief like this, it demonstrates its inherent power, sharpness, and accuracy. It, bear, it bears constant reminding that as we submit ourselves to the Word of God, we do it for far, far more than intellectual knowledge or to learn Bible facts. We do it for the ministry of the Word because God meets us in His Word. And the Holy Spirit works powerfully through the Word of God. The spiritual work of God, or the spiritual work of God's Word, goes far beyond the basic educational value of learning the Bible. Because, you know, the Bible isn't just, the Bible isn't a collection of merely old stories and myths. It has inherent life and power. Remember, the preacher doesn't make the Bible come alive because it already is. The Bible is alive. And it gives life to the preacher and anyone else who will receive it with faith. So, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. God's word teaches, uh, reaches us with surprising precision, and the Holy Spirit empowers the ministry of the word to work deeply in our hearts. I've, often people, yeah, you, you probably hear people wonder how a preacher's message can be so relevant, can be so on point to their life. They sometimes may wonder that if the preacher has a secret information about their life or knows something about their life. But it isn't necessarily the, the preacher at all. It is the sharpness of the Word of God, delivering the message in just the right place. So the word of God divides the soul and spirit, indicating a division can be made between them. There is nothing is hidden before God. He sees our heart and he knows how to touch it. And the question is, 
how are we going to respond on his touch? We must give account for how we respond to the touch of God. The word of God, as it says, can even can separate spiritual things, which seems completely intertwined, such as the soul and spirit. Um, that is not meant to be literal, as the Bible often uses these terms interchangeably. Rather, this is a graphic explanation of how completely God's word can distinguish between the godly and the ungodly. To man, the soul and spirit seems indistinct indistinguishable but the word of god can even discern between these this incredible cutting power of the scripture is therefore a tool to separate our very thoughts into good and evil it seems that all of this statement about the description or about the word of god is out of place at this point because we were talking about god's rest and how we should enter it we are likely ready for a big exhortation of how to go into it. But instead, the author focused on a description of the scripture. There is like an abrupt shift. But God's rest in Hebrews 4, 1 to 11 has a connection to the description of the word of God in Hebrews 4 to 13. How does the rest of God connect with the word of God? So, the author has made his case to enter God's rest by faith. He has used many Old Testament scriptures, like as an example in his uh, exposition on Psalms 95. He also referred to the book of Joshua, Numbers, Exodus, and Genesis. He wrote of Moses and his replacement Joshua, the angels, and the prophets. He has also quoted Genesis, Psalms, Isaiah, and many more. And given the context of this passage, loaded with Old Testament references, this is clearly about the written scriptures. Specifically, the ultimate measuring stick for our obedience to God is His Word. Yeah, the, me the ultimate measuring stick for our obedience to God is His Word. Hebrews 3.12 warns Christians to take care against having a heart of unbelief, going back to that. The only way to properly diagnose this condition is with the Word of God. So, the author seems to have expected the Word of God to intermix with human hearts. He also thought that the Word would create movement in the hearts of his hearers. But how does this happen? It is the Word of God which continually holds out the possibility of an entirely different kind of life. The author expected the word to hold that life to his readers or that life out to his readers over and over again. And as it is life and message cut and divided within their hearts, they would be left exposed before God. And then craving that deeper experience of rest it offered. And he makes it very clear that they can't give up on Jesus and keep hidden from God. The Word of God discovers and exposes their condition. Indeed, God's Word, if you open yourself up to it, will cut and divide and show who you are. Mess with it and it will mess with you. It will detail for your life, for you, the life of rest. It will prod you along so that you get it. The Word of God is alive. So, to conclude the topic, invitation to God's rest, and God's rest is offered in God's word, entering God's rest should be our main priority. We have to strive. Can you say to the person beside you, strive. We have to be diligent. Say to the person beside you, we have to be diligent to enter the rest. Yeah, the God, God's rest. Because obedience, uh, disobedience, and unbelief will keep us from entering God's rest. Be, continue to strive. Continue to be diligent. So we must honestly and transparent, transparently ask help from God to enter entirely into God's rest. His rest is available and it, it, and it is by faith to those who come to it, into it. So let us daily pursue Him 
and the life he has stored for us. God's rest is offered in God's word. When we rely on God's word, it will guide us and lead us to God's rest. We have to take care against having a heart of unbelief. And the only way to properly diagnose this condition is with the word of God. So uh, that's it for the, 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 um, the invitation to Christ's rest. But now let's look at Jesus as our high priest. Let's read in um, Hebrews 4, uh, 14 to 16 in ESV version. It says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Um, in Hebrews 2.17, this is where... Um, the idea of Christ as a high priest was first introduced. But here in Hebrews 4.14, that his role begins to be explained. Our passage focuses on the implications of the high priest designation. It's justification as a role not being given until Hebrews 5. A high priest is another title that we should think of when we think of Jesus. Jesus was presented here as a great high priest yeah in ancient times high priests function as intermediaries uh, they offer they're the ones who offered sacrifices for the appeasement of the god of god and the sins of the people they also offered intercessions and prayers pleading the case of people before god basically they are the ones who stood in the gap between god and the people and here Jesus is described as a great high priest who has passed through heavens, Hebrews 4.14. And this idea that Jesus as high priest has passed through the heavens may sound strange to many readers, but this is an essential component um, in his identity as a high priest. It refers to Jesus' resurrection and ascension, and it is only through these events that it was possible for Christ to have become a high priest because Jesus could not have been an early priest due to his Jewish tribal identity as places like in Hebrews um, 7.14 says and Hebrews 8.4 says it is by virtue of his exaltation to God's right hand that he holds his role in Hebrews 8.1 and for the fact that he operates as a high priest in heaven is what establishes his priesthood as superior to the earthly ones. Hebrews 8, 5-6 He is a high priest who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet is without sin. In Jesus, we have a high priest who is empathetic with our weaknesses and struggles. Hebrews 4, 15 emphasizes the ability of Jesus to identify with human weakness, an ability resulting from his own human status. This ties in the argument of chapter 2, that it is Jesus' human status, um, including his having experienced suffering and death that enables him to save mankind. Thus, while it is important that Jesus is at God's right hand in heaven, it is equally important that Jesus was human. Um, or Jesus is human, since he himself has faced full spectrum of temptations. Sometimes we think that Jesus, that just because um, Jesus is God, he could never know what temptation the way we do. In part, this is true. Jesus faced temptation much more severely than we ever have or ever will. Jesus, the sinless one, knows temptation in ways we don't. Because only the one who never gives into temptation knows the full strength of temptation. 
it is true that Jesus never faced temptation in inner sense the way we do, because there was no never a sinful nature pulling him to sin from the inside. But he knew the strength and fury of external temptation in a way to a degree that we can never know. He knows what we went through or he knows what we go through and he has faced worse. So definitely Jesus can sympathize with our weakness and our tem temptations. But, but he cannot sympathize with our sin. We should not think that this makes Jesus less sympathetic to us that he could understand us better if he had sin himself. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, but listen to me, do not imagine that if the Lord Jesus had sinned, he would have been any more tender toward you. For sin is always a hardening nature. If the Christ of God could have sinned, he would have lost the perfection of his sympathetic nature. So, the brief reference in verse 15 that Jesus was fully tempted, yet without sin, often strikes readers' notice. This idea is often stated in the New Testament, like 2 Corinthians 5.21, 1 Peter 2.22, and 1 John 3.5. Here, it serves no major function in the point of the passage, but this puts a limit on the extent which Jesus identifies with us. It is important in Hebrews, however, since Jesus could not have been the perfect heavenly high priest if he was tainted with sin. Or in other words, his sinlessness is yet another way in which we see his superiority compared to the earthly priest. It is also important that the status of Jesus as a human did not necessarily entail a status of sin. Being human does not in itself imply being sinful, not in God's original design. On the contrary, sin is a perversion of God's intention for humanity. Thus, when Hebrews speak in 2.10, uh, Hebrews 2.10, where Jesus bringing his brothers and sisters to glory, we can confidently have faith that our ultimate destiny is one without sin as well. While we now must struggle with sin, Hebrews 12, 4, perfection is part of our end design, the fulfillment of God's promise, Hebrews 11, 39 to 40. The movement of Jesus between heaven and earth transformed the role of the priesthood. Because of Jesus, the boundaries that have separated humanity from God are permeable. We can approach God and because of our great high priest Jesus hallelujah hallelujah so to conclude this topic about Jesus as our high priest um, let's look at verse 16 um, it says there we may approach him with confidence expecting to receive mercy and grace we can approach our great high priest with confidence with confidence meaning we may come constantly we may come without reservation. We can come freely without any fancy words. We can come with confidence and we should come with persistence. Ancient Jewish rabbis taught that God had two thrones, one of mercy and one of judgment. They say this because they knew God was both merciful and just, but they could not reconcile these two attributes of God. They thought that perhaps God had two thrones to display the two aspects of his character. On one throne, he showed judgment, and on the other throne, mercy. But here, in light of the finished work of Jesus Christ, we see mercy and judgment reconciled into one throne of grace. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So let me repeat that. Let me repeat that. So in the finished work of Jesus Christ, we see mercy and judgment reconciled into one throne of grace. Indeed, his very throne is described as a throne of grace. Remember that grace does not ignore God's justice. 
it operates in fulfillment of God's justice in the light of the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here we may tie in verses 12, 13. For while our whole beings are exposed to God, we can hide nothing. This is this is cause not for despair, but for hope. The ultimate encouragement we are to receive from all this is stated in the end of verse 14. It says, let us hold fast to our confession. There should be no greater encouragement to us as Christians than that of the mercy and grace God promised to us. Mercy and grace that are based on Christ having loved us enough to identify with us to the point of suffering and death hallelujah hallelujah so let us pray hallelujah lord we thank you all our god for the rest that you have offered to us through jesus christ our god lord we thank you that it is always available and we can enter it through faith all our god lord get rid of any unbelief or any distrust or any doubts in us all our god so that we will continue to trust in you and that we will obey your word and we will be able to enter your rest, O oh Lord God. O oh Lord God, we thank you also for Jesus being our great high priest, O oh Lord God. We thank you, O oh Lord God, that because of his work on the cross, we have been saved. And we now have an access to you, O oh Lord God. That division, O oh Lord God, is now bridged, O oh Lord God. By the cross, O oh Lord God. Lord, we thank you, O oh Lord God. And we thank you, Lord, for the lives of the people who are here tonight who have listened to this Bible study. And we pray, O oh Lord God, that there is something, O oh Lord God, that will be happening in their lives. Something that is amazing, O oh Lord God. Something that will be life transforming, life changing, O oh Lord God, as they have um as they have heard this word, O oh Lord God. Lord, continue to move in each one of us, O oh Lord God, and we ask, O oh Lord God, that you will continue to protect us, O oh Lord God, and grant us your favors, Lord, wherever we go. Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Good night, and thank you. Bye.